Greetings! Let's continue with my 10 GHz transverter project. The next step for me is to get a low noise amplifier, a preamplifier for reception, with very low noise, of course. I'm trying to save as much money as possible in spending on brand new stuff. In this case, Downey's Microwave, they sell a preamplifier with 20 dB of gain, and in a kit form, ordered, delivered, it's going to be more than $100 US to get just a preamplifier. Hmm. Trying to save on this. So I've heard that it's possible to repurpose those KU band dish heads for digital TV. In this case, those services that were very popular in the early 2000s for regular 4.3 format TV, but digital. And we have a few examples here that I collected in my junk box. The first one here is a unknown brand, unknown circuit, very likely for the KU band. It uses WR90 waveguide and it has uh, a linear amplifying strip here with probably a mixer as well, uh, somewhere around here and a low frequency, so the IF amplifying strip. So lots of components in there, interesting, but unknown totally. I also had in my jump box this Aspen, Eagle Aspen. It's uh, written 11.7 .7 to 12.2 gigahertz, IF 950 to 1450 uh, megahertz. So KU band, receive down converter, two signals, and that's for the two polarities, vertical, horizontal, and uh, self-contained with a cover. Normally there's a cover, but uh, we tend to get rid of those. So there's a circuit in there with the same thing, preamplifiers like uh, FET amplifiers, a mixer to down convert to uh, 900 megahertz uh, and so on. So that could be useful. And finally, this guy, this is actually our TV system that I've recovered. Uh, it's a dish network. It's called a digital LNB model 214-5100-402. And this was on our Bell Express View digital service that we had for oh, seven or eight years, if not more, I forgot. But uh, we had TV with this and I recovered. And well, I, you know, I was tempted to see what's in there because it's Dish Network. This is very popular. If you look on eBay, you'll find similar heads. So very common. I decided to crack open this thing and see what I could do with it. And with, you know, potential for other units, maybe if this doesn't work. So I did crack it open and uh, which was pretty easy. And this is what you get with a cover and the cover had to be removed and it's sealed. So this is a spare unit that I have, okay? Um, I didn't even know I had it in my junk box. The real unit for our TV service was this guy here that I've already opened and recovered the PCB inside. So here's the PCB I've recovered inside the unit. And uh, it's uh, not FR4, by the way. It's probably some of Roger's material or something like that. Quite brittle PCB and fragile. It's not like FR4, very solid and rigid and hard to chip. This one is a bit fragile. So you got, you got to play uh, easy with it and not overheat the surface either. Okay, so what we have clearly is uh, the mouth where the horn brings in the signals. And so, so this is the RF and uh, the LO in the middle here, mixing, mixer, and the IF uh, and, and the supply, of course, with a 7806, so 6 volt regulator. So that 6 volt is sent to the uh, receive strip here. The bottom side, there's really nothing interesting other than a ground plane. So now, the business end. Like I said, the RF comes in from Waveguide, the horn. It's got two probes that are at right angle, one from the other. And we have two identical strips of 12 gigahertz. Uh, so I believe, not sure, but I believe it's because uh, depending on the polarization you select, it's a different transponder from the satellite. 
So uh, you can pick one or the other, or the control box, the set-top box uh, for the TV will select the right one depending on the channel you're tuning. So the beauty about this is that we get two chances to do it right. <laughs> if we blow up one side, we have another one available. So I'll be working only on one side, but you understand we have two identical strips. The chip here, the ZTEX chip, is uh, for biasing the FETs. These are gas FETs and uh, they have negative bias, negative voltage, and this chip takes the 6 volts from the regulator and will supply um, the proper biases on the gate and on the drain. And same thing here, so a total of four transistors can be biased by this single chip. So we definitely want to keep this chip along with uh, the transistors, of course. We have some uh, trim pots here, very likely to tune the biases to optimize the current, probably. And I'm not going to be touching those. Okay, so if we look at one strip in particular, we start from a probe. This is 50 ohm impedance tracks. You see the width here? So if you hit a big square like this of copper, it's very likely an extra capacitance for tuning the input. This couples with the ground plane underneath and it creates a capacitor. Uh, the supplies are fed by these very thin traces. They represent a high reactance due to their inductance. So it sort of blocks the RF signal and these squares as well will uh, null out any RF that's left over from here. And then from this point on with the decoupling cap here, uh, bias resistor, it's really DC. Okay, and it's the same for input and output. Uh, it's the same same principle. Okay, so we have two transistors, two FETs. One is marked K and the other one is marked L. Same thing here, K and L. So I did a bit of research trying to figure out what these transistors were. Are they broadband? Will they work at 10 gigahertz? What kind of gain? What kind of noise figure? Especially the K1, which is the first transistor to pick up the signal. And with just a marking K and L and a bit of searching uh, on Google, I found what they are. They are NEC, NEC, NE3210S01, that's the K, and the L is the NE4210S01. So if you look at the performance of these transistors at 12 gigahertz, mind you, we have 13.5 dB of gain and a noise figure of 0.35. Wow. <laughs> hey, we're in business. That's a very low noise transistor for the front end. Followed by another stage, the second stage, the L transistor. 0.5 dB of noise figure, not important as much because we get a lot of gain on the first stage and another 13 dB of gain. So that's at 12 gig though. So we can expect realistically more than 20 dB of gain and a noise figure of probably better than 0.5 dB. Of course, when we say this, we don't take into account any losses in the coax or transition or anything ahead of that preamp. But at least the transistor is a very good transistor. Very happy with that. And the spec sheet is readily available. They have other transistors that they describe in this uh, data sheet. But hey, it's really, really good. And when you look at drawings of how things work, well, here's a typical example of how they're used. And that's pretty much what we have. Uh, not quite, but it's, it's the right configuration. Two strips of RF, the 3210S01 followed by the 4210S01 followed by a mixer, uh, an LO, local oscillator, going to the two strips, two identical strips, so the LO is split, and then some IF work with crossover switching and some IF amplifiers. So this front end is hot. I want this. <laughs> but how to interface to it? Let's look at the input. The input should be relatively easy to couple to. First, filing off this probe here and make a nice circle. Second, either come in with a coaxial cable horizontally like this and solder right here with ground plane underneath soldered to the shield and maybe even couple the shield to the top here 
on the two sides. This is not the best way to do it, but at least for a first try, it will make this system work. And I'll be able to try it, you know, at 10 gig. This is 12 gig, 12.5 gig strip with some definite tuning of the output with some stubs as well, 50 ohm trays, a hairpin bandpass filter centered around 12.4 gigahertz, and then the output going to the mixer, the yellow being here with a bandpass filter, of course. So I decided to give it a try and to solder right here on the output and give it a try at 12.4 gig, and it worked. It had some gain, definitely. It had more than 20 dB of gain at 12.4 gigahertz, even coupling loosely with a coax here. So it was really promising. So what I decided to do is to get rid of this because we would have to extend those stubs uh, with some very thin copper uh, traces. And besides, we have pipe cap filters as well on the transverters. So we don't really need a bandpass filter here. It would have been optional. But like I said, I tried it at 12.4, brought it down to 10.368. And of course, it was less than 10 dB of gain. I had a lot of losses here. and But it worked still, but it was not good enough. So I said, mm -mm, out it goes. And instead, I'm going to couple right here. So I soldered a coax here, still coming in horizontally with the coax. Good quality, of course. It's what we call conformable cable, so semi-rigid conformable cable. And same thing here, semi-rigid conformable cable. And it definitely worked well at 10.368 gigahertz. But the one thing I did is I checked the S11, so the reflection losses, what kind of VSWR standing wave ratio are we getting when we come in here? Do we get a lot of reflection with this approach of having a coax that comes in horizontally here and just solders to, to, to the track here? Well, it was not good. I had a 3.5 to 1 VSWR. It still worked fine. I had plenty of gain at 10.368, but it was not a great VSWR. So instead, I decided to come in perpendicular to the PCB surface. What I did is I just drill a hole right here, okay, and came in from the bottom. And I'll show you in a second how it's done. But drill a small hole with a PCB manufacturing drill, drill bit. I think it's 0.4 millimeter, I believe, that I took. And on the output, do the same thing. Drill right here and come in perpendicular from the back side. Um, I did disconnect this completely. I scratched off the input port of the filter. so And I cut off the excess trace here. And I made sure that this was really flush and cut off the excess here. And the other thing I did, because it's DC coupled, and it's not good if you come in with a single generator, there's a risk of blowing up here. There's voltage, right? There's voltage here, there's bias. So there's a risk of blowing up the single generator. Directly from the antenna, it would not be a problem because it's not a DC grounded antenna, the horn itself. But it's best to add a capacitor. So I did, you know, tear off the track and added a high quality ATC ceramic capacitor right here to AC couple into the transistor. And it worked great. The VSWR is 1.4 to 1. So I'm not going to touch it. That's great for me. And I have a nice preamplifier. And I'll show you what the result is on the board. This is how I come in from the bottom side. I did scratch off a certain perimeter of ground to make sure that it doesn't short out the center conductor to ground, but just a little bit, just to clear the hole. And this is the input port. I used real semi-rigid UT085, I believe. So the smaller semi-rigid. And I use conformable cable here uh, on the output. And uh, yeah, on the other side, it's barely visible. But this is what we have. We have uh, the input right here. And the output is right here. And uh, I did leave on the other channel the first method of interfacing, so coming from the antenna with a coax, attacking the PCB trace horizontally, and picking up also horizontally the signal. 
and of course trying to keep things as short as possible and putting some ground strapping on both sides to pick up the shield and bring it to the ground plane but this was not great at 10 gig like i mentioned bad vswr the perpendicular approach of attacking with a very small hole on the center of the track is the best way to go and same thing for the output and i'll just be removing these this was a first first trial and um, yeah i did add the coupling capacitor right at the input here difficult to see but it's there and the performance is there it works it works very well i get 22 db of gain noise figure difficult to measure at those frequencies but the best way to demonstrate that this thing works well is to make you hear the results okay i've hooked up the lna the low noise amplifier or pre-amplifier if you wish so i have my single generator that comes in with the blue cable here in black i'm injecting through 40 db of attenuation to make sure i can reach really really low singles coming from the single generator my test generator and so i come in into the lna low noise amplifier or preamplifier if you wish i come out of the preamplifier into the receive port of my transverter of course on the other side it's the same as before my 10 megahertz uh, ovenized oscillator into the uh, adf 4351 synthesizer chip into the tripler and then 10.224 gigahertz into the LO port of the transverter. And I'll be listening on the IF out, 144 megahertz sent into this receiver. All right, we're ready for the test. So test is started. You can hear the noise. I will increase the signal. We can see. We can hear it clearly. Currently, we are at minus 124 dBm. That's pretty low, but it's not low enough. This is considered a medium strength signal, right? So let me reduce another 10 dB, minus 134 dBm. We can clearly hear it still, minus 144 dBm. Yeah, we can still hear it. What's the carrier to noise measurement in dB? Can this be copied like in Morse code, CW? Well, let's look at the, the measurement. If we measure the carrier to noise level for minus 144 dBm, which is, by the way, 14 nanovolt of signal, that's really small. Well, we still have more than 10 dB of carrier to noise it's the green colors red being hold the signal hold green being the actual signal so we have more than 15 i'd say 15 db of carrier to noise level at minus 144 so we could still copy that signal with good earphones and a narrow band filter it wouldn't be difficult to copy so my cheap lna makes a very good front end very insensitive for copying weak signals very happy with the results now next step the power amplifier it will likely be the subject of my next video so stick around 73